say these chains will never break but they don't know you like we do there is power in your name we've heard that there is no way through we've heard the tide will never change they haven't seen what you can do. There is power in your name. So much power in your name. Move the immovable. Break the unbreakable. God, we believe. God, we
Well, I pray and trust that you've been blessed by that particular musical selection. God, you said it. I believe it. It is so. And that's really uh, the whole bridge towards experiencing the supernatural power of God in our lives. Whatever it is that God has said, you and I must believe it, must have the corresponding faith that says, God, if you said it, it settles my heart. And I have the sole conviction that whatever it is that you've said, I believe it. And so, again, I pray that that particular selection has ministered to you. And let me as well just thank you for being a part of our online Bible study. I'm super excited about our time together on today as we're dealing again with the topic and theme, the supremely blessed life, as we are considering what is known as the Beatitudes, as they are recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number five. And so we're coming somewhat to the end of this particular series, and I'm looking forward to the upcoming series uh, that we'll be sharing with you uh, in the near future. Let me open us in a word of prayer and that we'll dive right into the word of God. Let's pray. God, how we honor you, how we thank you and how we bless you for this day. And we give your name praise and we give your name glory. And even now, as we position ourselves and posture ourselves to hear your word, we ask, oh God, that you would speak to us. We pray, oh God, that we will be sensitive to your tender, small voice, even now as you speak and help us, oh God, not just to be hearers of your word, but most importantly, help us as well to be doers of your word. In Jesus Christ's name, I pray in. Amen. Again, it is in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number five, that we're dealing with what is known as the supremely blessed life. And also it is defined as the Beatitudes, as it constitutes the sermon of our Christ, the sermon of Jesus on the mount. Notice what the text says in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number five. And just let me share this with you today. We're going to just quickly go over all that we've taught up to this point so that we can see the progression of the whole concept as it relates to the supremely blessed life. So Matthew 5 verse 1 opens saying, seeing the crowds, he went up into the mountain and when he was set, his disciples came unto him and he opened his mouth and taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the poor in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you. When others revile you, persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Again, we're dealing with what is known as the supremely blessed life. It comes from this collection of kingdom principles and values that are articulated by Christ that are known as the Beatitudes. As we look at the Beatitudes, they can be classified and categorized as being paradoxical. Paradoxical in the sense that they go against conventional wisdom and knowledge. It goes against the teaching, if you would, of the world. Not only are they paradoxical, but they're also personal. Jesus is speaking to us as followers and as disciples. He is speaking to us personally. But also these Beatitudes and the principles of a supremely blessed life are possible and not just possible, but they are practical. There are actually principles that we can live by and govern our lives by. And in doing so, we experience the favor of God, the blessings of God. But also, as we'll see again today, they are progressive. When I speak in terms of progressive, we see how the various principles uh, begin to line up with one another and they progress towards this whole aspect of the blessed life. 
Now, in light of that, you and I must come to this particular sense of awareness that Jesus came to earth, not just to die for our sins, but he also came so that you and I might live the abundant life as is seen in the Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 10. He's come in order that you and I might live what is known as the blessed life and not just the blessed life, but notice, notice the superlative, the supremely blessed life. And so it is here in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number five, in the Beatitudes that we see, if you would, the steps towards the supremely blessed life. And here is step number one. Step number one, we must admit our sins. Again, in verse number three, it says, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, it denotes having this sense of humility about ourselves, coming to a point in place of a sense of awareness regarding our spiritual poverty and admitting our need for forgiveness. And so the point is simply this. Jesus is teaching that the door towards the blessed life is very low. In other words, you and I must have a spirit of humility. And this spirit of humility denotes that you and I must bow before a holy God, recognizing that we cannot be filled with the blessed life until we are empty of pride, until we are empty of pride. Notice, if you would, what Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 23, verse number 12, he says, but those who exhort themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Again, I made mention of how the kingdom values that are taught by Christ are paradoxical. And so the blessed life begins with us being poor in spirit. And notice what the text says. As a result of such, there's the kingdom of heaven. And that phrase, there's the kingdom of heaven, is in the present tense, meaning that we don't have to wait until we get to heaven to know what it really means to live the blessed life. But rather, you and I can experience it even right now. And notice again what Jesus says in the Gospel of John, chapter number five, verse number 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believe him who sent me has eternal life. And he does not come into judgment, but pass from death to life. Or even beyond that, other translations uh, say, utilize the phrase cross over or crossed over, which again is in the perfect tense, which denotes that it is a complete transaction and a settled issue. And this means that our home in heaven is a present reality. And so eternal life and the kingdom of heaven are our current possessions at the very moment that we accept Christ as Lord and Savior. So step number one, we must admit our sinfulness and recognize our spiritual poverty, poor in spirit. Step number two, we must now not only come to a point in place that we admit our sinfulness, but we must also agonize over our sins. Look at the progression in verse number four. Verse number four helps us to see that there's not just this intellectual recognition of sin, but then this intellectual recognition of sin also now leads to a sense of agony, wherein as a result of the guilt of sin, we find ourselves responding with a mournful heart. We are mourning, if, if you would. Uh, it can also be defined as good mourning in the sense that there's a sense of sorrow. And this term to mourn, as is seen again, denotes that we have this sense of agony, almost as if the type of agony that is experienced in the death of a loved one. And so Jesus puts it this way, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And so notice, if you would, the barrier to this step is oftentimes failing to respond, failing to come to the point in place of being responsible for our actions. And oftentimes when we come to a point in place where we fail to be responsible for our actions, we end up having what is known as the victim mentality. And this victim's mentality is pervasive and is prominent throughout our culture. And notice what the text says, however, that when we come to God with a humble disposition and when we now come to him, not only with a sense of humility, but also with a sense of awareness, a sense of awareness that causes us to have a response of agony over our sins, a sense of brokenness, if you would, over our sins. The text says that he will forgive us immediately. The Bible says that we will be comforted. And so the whole contrast to this aspect of mourning, which has this uh, sense of agony, it is contrast with the response or the disposition, if you would, of comfort. 
And so in light of that, we recognize that when we experience the forgiveness of God, it is always fully given, freely given and forever granted. Notice, if you would, what the gospel are better yet the book of Psalms, uh, chapter 38, verse number four says, as it relates to this whole aspect of the feeling that David had uh, as a result of sin. He says in Psalms 38, verse number four, let me, as I read this passage of scripture, ask of you to begin to personalize it and see if you can as well uh, see moments in your life that you have the same sort of response as David. Psalms 38, verse number four. For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. In other words, David is saying that the sense of guilt that comes as a result of shame is like a heavy burden that is upon us. And notice what the text says, that Jesus says, I offer to you, here it is, comfort. And comfort is the result of the guilt having now been removed or the guilt now having been lifted, if you would. And as one has said, listen to this statement. It would be worth it would be worth it to be a Christian, even if there was no heaven, just so that we can have our sins forgiven and even beyond that, get rid of our guilt. And so that is true. And so we see this whole aspect of our humility. That we come to a point in place, of course, of recognizing that we're poor in spirit, our spiritual poverty. As a result of such, now it progresses to this moment of agonizing over our sin. But here's the third step. We must act now with meekness. Notice what he says in verse number five. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. That word meek does not mean weak. Meek does not mean weak, but rather it means Power under control, power under control. It refers to the process of domesticating, if you would, a wild animal, such as a horse for that matter. And as a result of the horse now being domesticated, that horse now that has brute power, power, power is now under control as a result, here it is, of one who has taken control over the horse. As one has gone through the process of taming the horse, uh, even beyond that, breaking the horse as it is defined. Here's the other term, domesticating the horse. They now make the horse useful. And so this beatitude is in essence saying that in order to live the blessed life, our lives must be harnessed. In other words, meekness has this uh, connotation of gentleness. As a result of us being poor in spirit, we now mourn over our sins. As a result of us mourning over our sins, we come to a point in place that we have a spirit of meekness. In other words, we now give control of our lives over to Christ. Now, the biblical connotation of this aspect of meekness is the term repentance. And repentance denotes more than just having a sense of sorrow over our sins, but rather repentance denotes that there's a change in our hearts, there's a change in our minds. And as a result of how we have changed our hearts, our minds, how we've changed what we believe, watch this now, it results in our changing how we behave. Because our beliefs always influence our behavior. And so as a result of such, we come to a point in place that we give control of our lives over to God. In other words, we come to a point in place of meekness. It is seen in Acts chapter number three, verse number 18, or verse number 19, excuse me, where this whole attitude of meekness is described. Acts three, verse 19. Repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And so meekness is submitting to the control of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And as a result of such, we allow the Holy Spirit now to produce meekness within us in and of ourselves. We cannot do this. We need God through the power and through the person and through the presence of the Holy Spirit to bring us to the posture and the position of meekness. And notice, if you would, that even second Corinthians Chapter five, verse 17 describes the results of true repentance. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. 
The old has passed away and behold, this new has come. And so again, notice the progression. It starts off with the whole sense of humility, uh, spiritual poverty. It then advances or progresses to this moment or to this experience of agony over our sins. And it brings us now to a point wherein we act with meekness. But then Jesus goes as far as to say that as we go through this whole process of meekness, we will inherit the earth. In other words, that term inherit denotes that we will receive our lot. We will receive our portion that there is implied in this verse a present blessing that comes as a result of meekness. And so here is what Jesus is teaching us, that when we have a disposition of meekness and when we come under the Lordship of Christ and the leadership of Christ, we then inherit a blessing as a result of such. And this gives our lives a sense of significance. It gives our lives a sense of purpose. It gives our lives a sense of fulfillment. But here it is. Step number four. As a result of such, now we aspire for righteousness. There's this aspiration. There's this aspiration for righteousness. Notice the progression. Poverty over sin. Notice the progression. Progression, agony over sin. I come to a point in place of meekness. And now I have this new appetite or better yet, I have this new aspiration. And the new aspiration that I have is righteousness. I've come from a point of sinfulness to now a point of righteousness. And notice again the progression. We are poor in spirit. That's the intellectual recognition of our sins, which leads us to agony over our sins. That is the emotional response to the to the awareness of sin that now brings us to the disposition of meekness about our sinfulness, which brings us to that place of the Lordship and the leadership of Jesus Christ, resulting now here it is in this new spiritual reality that I have an aspiration. I have an appetite, if you would, for righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And so, again, the previous uh, steps brings us to this point and place that there's a greater appetite. There's a greater uh, aspiration for that which is right. I no longer want to live life in a sinful way. I no longer want to live life going against the will of God, going against the word of God. I now live life with this insatiable hunger and thirst for righteousness. That is when you can tell when spiritual life is really taking root within your heart because there's a greater appetite that we have. And this appetite is an appetite for what is right. Righteousness. I have an ap appetite for the word of God. I have an appetite for being right in how I walk and right in how I talk and righteous in how I live and righteous in how I treat others. There's this great appetite, if you would, even again, as stated for the word of God. And notice what Psalms 119 verse 103 says about the word of God. It says, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And so one of the key signs that you have this hunger and thirst for righteousness is that you have this insatiable desire for the will of God. I want to do his will. You have this insatiable desire to walk with God. I want to be in fellowship and relationship with God. But you also have an insatiable desire for the word of God. And the text says again in Psalms 119 verse 103 that his word becomes sweet to us. It's not sour. His word becomes sweet to us. And so that helps us to see that there is this appetite. There is this aspiration for the word of God. And here is what Jesus says is the result of such. You will be filled if would. That word filled means here it is. You will be satisfied. There's a sense of fulfillment that comes. And so here's the contrast that before Christ, we have this appetite. We have this hunger after three things. We have a hunger for the lust of the flesh the lust of the eye and the pride of life. We have a hunger, if you would, for pleasure and we have a hunger for a prestige. We have a hunger for possessions. We have a hunger for sets and, su and success and all of the other uh, sensationalism of life and living. But now as a result of us coming from this point in place of our sense of intellectual awareness of sin, my poverty, my spiritual bankruptcy, if you would, 
coming to this point in place that I'm mourning over my sin. There's a sense of agony and sorrow over my sin. It brings me to this place of meekness as it relates to now I submit myself to the Lordship and the leadership of Jesus Christ. And now I have this new aspiration and appetite for righteousness. In other words, I now desire more and more of God seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. And so I'm no longer seeking after the things of the world that cannot satisfy me. I'm no longer seeking for the pleasures of this world. I'm no, no longer seeking for the possessions of this world. I'm no longer seeking, if you would, for the prestige of this world, but rather I'm seeking after his righteousness. And as a result of such, I will find myself in this place of spiritual fulfillment and spiritual satisfaction. It was St. Augustine who gave this insightful statement that there is a God sized vacuum in every human heart that only he can fill. Step number three, we must now allocate mercy. As a result of my having this aspiration of righteousness, as a result of my attitude of meekness, as a result of my sense of agony over sin, as a result of my sense of a spiritual intellectual awareness about my soul, desperate need for God, poor in spirit, I now must allocate mercy. Be merciful, in other words, denotes that I extend compassion. I, I extend a sense of, of helpfulness. A wonderful biblical example of that is the Good Samaritan. Of course, in contrast to the opposite sense of selfishness with our time, our talents and our resources, one who is merciful is like the Good Samaritan, who's willing to extend themselves in an act of compassion, in an act of care, in an act of charity towards someone else in need. In other words, we begin to live life with this sense of awareness that life cannot just be lived in light of what I need, but rather I seek to allocate mercy even to others. And again, mercy is also not just the whole extension of kindness and compassion and even charity, but also mercy denotes the willingness to extend forgiveness to someone. In other words, because I recognize how God has forgiven me and how God has been merciful to me, it frees my heart from the sense of bitterness and even harboring a sense of resentment, animosity and hostility towards others. I refuse to hold on to a grudge. Now, notice again what Proverbs 21 and verse 10 says, describing a person of mercy. The soul of the wicked desires evil. His neighbor finds no mercy in his eyes. And so if we are merciful, Jesus says we will be shown mercy. If you want to receive mercy, here it is. You must release mercy. In other words, you reap what you sow. If you want to reap mercy in your life, you got to sow mercy. And so the point is simply this. This means that you and I. We'll receive compassion. We will receive help. We will receive forgiveness from God when we sow it to others. Here's the next step. Now we must avoid impurity. Notice what he says in verse number eight. There's an interesting term and that term is pure, which means the removal of being free from defilement or even beyond that being uncontaminated. It basically means in biblical terms to be holy. Now, of course, this whole aspect of being holy is a term that we oftentimes shun away from. But it really simply means that I come to a point in place that I seek to live a life that is no longer defiled by sin. I seek to live a life that is no longer contaminated with carnal behavior. And even James verse one, or chapter one, verse 27 helps us to see from a practical perspective what this whole aspect of purity really looks like. Listen to what James says in James 1 verse 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to act to visit the orphans and the widows in their afflictions and to help or to keep oneself unstained from the world. And so, 
This pure religion, if you would, as James would define it, is characterized by our willingness to help, to aid, to assist, to be of support to those who are disenfranchised and have been marginalized. We visit the orphans. We help the widows. Now, that's just an example that James is providing of those who've been marginalized, of those who've been disenfranchised, those who are in a season of affliction, if you would. But then he also says it's not just what you do towards others, but it's also the intentional process of living wherein you keep yourself unstained, says James, from the world. In other words, we try to avoid the pollution of the world. How do we do that? That's the question that all of us must consider. And here are three things that we outline. If you may recall, you must read God's word, request God's help and rely on God's spirit. We read the word of how shall a young man make clean his ways? Psalms 119 by adhering to the word of God, adhering to the word of God. And that I not only just read his word, but I also now must request of God's help. God, I can't do it without you. I cannot live this life of righteousness, nor can I live a life where I am not defiled or contaminated by the corrupt carnal culture, culture that I'm in. I need you to help me. And then I got to rely on the Holy Spirit. And the text says, as a result of such, we shall see God. And that does not mean that we see God uh, with our natural eyes per se as it relates to God being a material being, because God is, uh, is invisible. God is immaterial, if you would, intangible. But here is what the text is telling to teach us, that through the eyes of faith, we will have a pure heart that enables us to see God in places. We can see God in people, and we can even see God in the midst of problems. How can we see God? Here it is, in places. I mean, when you walk outside and you see the beauty of nature, his handiworks, we see God. Even in people, we see the image of God in people that has been marred by sin. But nonetheless, God is still within us. We are his creation. We have been stamped with his likeness made in his image. And I can even see God even through my problems and pains. And oftentimes it is through the problems and pains of life that I can best see God. Here's the next step as we come close, as we come to a close. Here it is. Number seven, we must attempt at being peacemakers. We're living one of two ways as troublemakers or as pe peacemakers. And Isaiah nine verse number six speaks of how Jesus is the prince of peace. And as a result of such, in us accepting Christ as Lord and Savior, we now have peace with God, according to Romans 5 and verse number 1. And in turn, we become ambassadors of peace. Here's what Paul says. We become ministers of reconciliation. We have become, we have become a part of what can be defined as the first kingdom peace corp. That we're going out seeking to bring men and women into a relationship with God, the father, that they might again have peace with God. And as a result of having peace with God, they now can have the peace of God. And so here is what the text is, help, is telling to teach us that as a result of such, we now seek to live life from a peaceful posture and position. We seek to live life. Peacefully. Notice, if you would, what Romans 14 and verse 19 says, Romans 14, verse number 19, it says. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. And so notice, if you would, that the world has such a deficiency of or better yet, such a low volume of peacemakers. Can I tell you why? It is because we're oftentimes so preoccupied with ourselves that we're no longer pursuing, if you would, what makes for peace. Let me tell you why. Because we're so oftentimes preoccupied on what separates us, what aspects of life we have disagreement on, and we focus on that as opposed to finding 
the aspects of coming good and not just coming good, but commonality where we can come together in a sense of agreement and we can pursue peace and not just pursue peace. But the ultimate goal is to mutually come to a point in place in life that we're upbuilding as opposed to tearing one another down. And so as peacemakers, we genuinely seek to heal ruptured relationships. We seek not to be troublemakers, not to go and keep a store, a, a scorecard of everyone else's faults, failures and fumbles, but rather we extend mercy so that we can receive mercy and we seek to be ambassadors of peace. And here's what the text says. And we pursue it. Now, here's the reality about being a peacemaker. That is a personal decision that you and I must make over and against the response that we may receive from the other person that we're seeking to be peaceful towards. There's moments, here it is, that even in your efforts, in my efforts of being a peacemaker, you may still end up dealing with someone who is not at that same place as it relates to their spiritual maturity. Or even beyond that, they're not pursuing peace. But you cannot allow the actions of others to dictate how you're going to react. You must resolve separate and apart, independent of how they may act. I choose to be a peacemaker. And here is what Jesus says. And you will be called the son of God. One of the ways we're in, we give evidence to the reality of our relationship with God. The father is by our intentionality of being peacemakers. You will be called sons of God. In other words, you and I are most like God and we reflect the character of God when we live life as peacemakers, recognizing that ultimately we can do it because Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace, lives within us. And it is from the presence of Christ that indwells us that gives us the capacity of being peacemakers. And now we come to step number eight. We must accept persecution. In other words, we must learn how to even rejoice when we're rejected. And it takes all seven of the aforementioned steps in order for us to get to point number eight. And so if we look at the previous seven steps, the natural result in this world will be the eighth beatitude that we can expect that we will end up experiencing rejection. Here's what he says in verse number 10. Jesus is blessed are those who are per persecuted because of righteousness for theirs, the kingdom of heaven. And so the sinful world that has the pressure on us to conform to it, as opposed to us having the righteous resolve to conform to what God has said, places us in a position where we become persecuted. Because again, we are living life counterculture. The culture that we live in is not a culture that looks for peace. I mean, look around the world. Everywhere you and I look, we see problems, we see animosity, we see hostility, we see wars. Even right now, Russia is in the throes of a potential war because that is the bent nature of the human heart. And as a result of such, we oftentimes, when we have a righteous resolve, when we come to the point in place that we say, I'm going to be a peacemaker, I'm going to live a life of righteousness, I'm going to live a life of being merciful, I'm going to live a life where I agonize over my sin. I'm going to live a life where I'm at a point in place of having an intellectual awareness about my spiritual poverty. Here is what the text says. You and I can rest assured that as a result of such each and every day of us attempting to live life by these kingdom principles, that we become the target of the world. And as a result of us becoming a target of the world, we become the target of their persecution. Because the world is against all of the values that we've just outlined. And so notice what the text says, that when we opt to live life, here it is, not just occasionally, but rather what Jesus is outlining for us is how you and I should seek to live life every single day. We seek to live life every single day with a sense of being poor in spirit, 
where we acknowledge our sins. We seek to live life every single day, mourning over our sins. Where we recognize, oh God, I blew it today. And I don't sit here and rejoice over my wrongdoings, but rather I agonize over it. We seek life each and every day seeking to be merciful. And we seek life each and every day submitting to the Lordship and the leadership of Jesus Christ. We seek life every day hunger, having a hunger and thirst for righteousness by reading his word. We seek life every day by living a merciful life and a peaceful life and seek to live life with a pure heart. As a result of such, when we do this every single day, rest assured that the world and the culture in which we live is not going to celebrate us, is not going to applaud us, but rather it's going to attack us, persecute us, reject us because it goes against how the world operates. But here's what Jesus says. But nonetheless, consider yourself blessed, supremely blessed, because you never become the target of insult until you make an impact. Does that make sense? And here's what Jesus says. You and I, as a result of such, we're blessed, supremely blessed. So I want to challenge you now. Of the eight different steps that we've outlined as it relates to the supremely blessed life, which one of the eight or which one of them, here it is, is most difficult for you? Of the eight that we've outlined, which one do you, do, do you sense the Holy Spirit is saying to you, hey, we need to work on this. We need to work on this. You, you got a bit too much pride and you haven't come to a point in place that you're poor in the spirit are. We need to work on this. You, you don't have a sense of broken heartedness over your sins. You're not mourning over your sins. It doesn't irritate you. you you're no longer at a point in place of contrition that you sin with peace. We need to work on that. We need to work on this meekness because you're still like a wild horse, if you would, bucking against the leadership and lordship of Christ. We need to work on that. We need to work on this aspect of being a peacemaker because you're always starting trouble. We need to work on that. Here's reality. None of us are perfect in all eight. All of us at some point throughout the course of life, throughout the course of the day, we find ourselves, oh, I should have been more merciful to that person. And I wasn't merciful, I was harsh, I was hard. You know, I overreacted. Ah, Holy Spirit, help me to be more merciful. I pray and trust that you would just really give time and space to allowing God to help pinpoint aspects within your life where you're not living up to these values that Jesus has outlined that's designed to help us to live a supremely blessed life. Process it for a moment, moment, think about it for a moment and ask God through his power to help you live out the values, the principles that is outlined in the Beatitudes as it relates to the supremely blessed life. Now listen, next week we're gonna talk about a few more elements that Jesus specifies here in Matthew chapter number five. I want to invite you and encourage you to be a part as we go a tad bit deeper into some additional points and principles that Jesus outlines for us. I pray and trust that today's study has encouraged you, has enriched you, has enlightened your life so that you can live the supremely blessed life. Let's pray. God, how we thank you for your word and how we thank you for our time together in your word. We pray, God, that you would help us not just to be hearers, but most importantly, help us to be doers, that we might live out these values, these principles that you've outlined in your word that gives us the template, the pattern, if you would, for a supremely blessed life. Help us now in the various eight steps that we've outlined tonight. Help us now to be intentional in living out each and every one. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, thank you for being a part. Let's do it again next week. Until then, be blessed. Take care.